I'm really happy to see all of you guys, and uh, I hope you're enjoying each other, each other's company. And I think this is going to be a wonderful evening tonight. Uh, I want to first, before I even start off, uh, thank all of the people that really put this together. Uh, Jerry Hayes uh, really did an awful. He did a big job and uh, did a fantastic job for us. Uh, we have a lot of other guys like uh, Mr. Endo back there. Mr. Endo did his poster. <laughs> the the uh, agenda this evening and did a fantastic job on that. And I really appreciate that. Uh, did a fantastic job. Uh, I don't know what to say because I think without their help, uh, this wouldn't be the way that it is. And of course, even more so, uh, the speakers, uh, they're my friends and they came up and they, I said, will you, will you speak? And only for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, uh, for you newcomers, you don't know about some of the things that that happened uh, in the old days, the way that they trained, the way that they worked out, the dedication that they had, and the way that they probably suffered in some some ways. Uh, you know, for, you know, for the old timers that are in this room, uh, the guys that I'm talking to are the guys that that know about the five cent cup of coffee. You know, and uh, maybe. Uh, Billy Holiday, names like that, from from the past, or at least you've had a, an inkling of that. Uh, you'll, you'll get a chance to kind of uh, peek back into the past and have a memory of those things, and I hope that it's a wonderful memory for you. And we have a, a great lineup for you guys, but before we even start in, uh, we're gonna have a dinner, and before we even do the dinner, I just wanna, uh, think about a couple of our past uh, judo people that have helped out because all of us, all, all of our judo people are, are what Mitchell says all the time. He says, uh, uh, we make, we make, uh, we don't make just champions, we make champions of character. And I think that's what, that's what our job is. You know, we make champions of character. We make kids that uh, are, dedicated, respectful, uh, and try hard, even against uh, hard times. When, when they get knocked down seven times, they get up eight, maybe even nine even sometimes. And uh, these are things that I think all of us instill in all of our students. Uh, and these guys, my friends, will be talking about this. At the end, uh, at the end of what Gary, Gary Gold calls a mitzvah, it's <laughs> an, an event, I guess, in a sense. Uh, uh, at the end, uh, I'm going to have my friend, uh, Jimmy Brinkman, who is from the East Coast. He came all the way out here to see his son, of course, but uh, uh, in the interim, he said, hey, you know what, I'm going to go in and see Mr. Nishioka here. Uh, Hayward, he knows me as Hayward. And uh, see if I can beat up on him again. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he's going to say a few words uh, to end everything for us. Well, hopefully. I, I did ask you, right? Yes, so. So uh, I want you to give him a rousing hand, and then, uh, you know, he's our friend. He's with us all the time, so we, we know him as Ernie. And so let's give him a big hand.
Good evening, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ernest Smith. I'm the uh, head uh, judo instructor for the uh, Barstow Judo Club. I am uh, honored to be here tonight with so many uh, judo friends that I hold in highest esteem. Our purpose uh, tonight would be to tell you a little bit about my uh, early judo training and why I still do judo and some of the benefits of judo. I first started judo practice in early 1955 when I was a 20-year-old Marine stationed in uh, Camp McNair, Japan. Uh, Camp McNair was located at the base of Mount Fuji. I had been told that uh, a judo training would make me uh, physically stronger, and mentally stronger, and morally stronger. And I have found all those predictions to be true in the uh, 61 years that I've been doing judo. I also found that uh, a judo training complemented my military physical fitness training. That is one of the reasons why I still uh, do judo. That's why I like uh, judo. I, was, I remember my first night at judo practice, and I also especially remember the first time I was thrown with the judo throw. I got thrown so hard, I thought I was going through the floor. <laughs> and uh, many uh, of the new students didn't come back. Uh, I came back because I really wanted to learn judo. I practiced judo for several months uh, while I was in Japan, and then we got transferred to uh, Okinawa, and I thought my judo days were over. But when I got to Okinawa, I found that judo was very big. Uh, so was a lot of other martial arts like Karate and Kendo and other martial arts. Almost all the police stations in Okinawa had a dojo because the uh, policemen had to be proficient in uh, Judo, Karate, and Kendo because they didn't carry firearms. I joined the Judo Club at the uh, Sukaran Army Base in Sukaran, Okinawa. And my sensei, uh, Kiko Ikemiya, uh, was the vice president of the Okinawan Judo Federation. And uh, he was, at the time, 42 years old, and he was a Rokadan, and he taught Judo to the American uh, military. And he taught the Army and Air Force on uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights and the Marines and the Navy on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday night at the Spielwell Field House in Camp Super in Okinawa. On my first night uh, at practice, uh, we had 42 Marines. And there was too many uh, students for class. So my sensei had some of his assistants demonstrate some zero throws. And the second night, we had 32 <laughs> Marines. <laughs> and there were still too many students. So they demonstrated some different judo throws. <laughs> and then on the third night, we had 16 <laughs> Marines. <laughs> and then they started teaching us judo. And I practiced judo until my tour was up in Okinawa, and I got transferred to uh, uh, Camp Hills in California. And the sensei at the judo club on the base was a staff sergeant, and he was an EQ. And he didn't really teach us judo throws. He taught us what he called advanced yukimi. <laughs> <laughs> It was kind of like you came in shadow boxing. You throw, you throw your body through the air and you fall down as if you were thrown by a particular judo throw. At first, 
I thought this guy was missing a few screws. <laughs> but later on, I found that his method, method was uh, really useful when I started learning how to do the copters and taking falls for five-year-old kids. I could jump through the air. I didn't learn much judo in 1957 uh, and 58, but I did learn how to do yukimi. <laughs> And in 1959, I got transferred to Okinawa again. I went back to Sukuma to my old dojo, same sensei, and I practiced. I was there for 16 months, so I advanced from Goku to EQ, uh, Brown Belt. And then when I made EQ, my sensei told me it's time to learn hard judo. <laughs> anyway, my teacher was, uh, was not a brutal teacher. He was a good teacher, but he wasn't brutal. So he took me to a, a dojo where his sensei was a brutal trainer, uh, Matsumoto. And Matsumoto's specialty was teaching you how to throw. And what he would do is line up 25 uh, black and brown belts and put you out front and you had to throw each guy 25 times as fast as they could get up off the uh, tatami. And that's 625 throws. Yeah. The first night I got to, uh, they tell me, I don't know, I got to <laughs> the 15th person and the lights went out. <laughs> first time I ever fainted in my life. When I woke up, they were popping ammonia capsules on my nose. And I didn't know where I was at. But after I finished my tour in, uh, in uh, Okinawa, this time I got transferred to uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And we had a strong club on the base in North Carolina. We had 12 uh, black belts. They ranked from uh, Shodan to Sundan. And they had seven brown belts, mostly EQs. And many of these guys had trained at Matsumoto's dojo. <laughs> and so I knew I was in big trouble. <laughs> Especially when we started doing Wanduri, because these guys try to kill you. And during uh, uh, 1960, we traveled to a lot of tournaments, at the, uh, in service tournaments at the military bases all the way from Fort Benning, Georgia, to uh, Reading, uh, Pennsylvania. And one day at the uh, Fort Halberd, Maryland tournament, uh, Professor Takahiko Ishikawa was a head referee. And after the tournament, he got on the mat and he was going to run dirty with the black belts. And one of my teammates, he was Staff Sergeant Nidon, he told me to to ask the sensei to do run dirty. I uh, said, so you don't want to work out with no brown belt. He's having too much fun throwing the black belt. <laughs> and he said, go ask him anyway. And since this guy is a knee down, and I was an EQ, I kind of like had to do what he said. So I went on the mat, and I was going to ask the sensei to do run dirty. And it seemed like he would turn away from me when he saw me coming and slam this guy that he was working with. And I'd run around and ask him again, and he slammed this guy again. Then finally he said, all right, goes over. He turned this guy loose and made this guy the happiest man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> then, he, then he commenced to throw me and as fast as I could get up. I didn't know they had that many throws in judo. <laughs> <laughs> I think he threw me with every throw known to mankind. <laughs> and when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, I said, thank you, Sensei. And he uh, slammed me again. <laughs> and I thought, he doesn't understand English. <laughs> And then I said, oh, I got to And he slammed me. I said, then I thought, 
He doesn't understand Japanese either. <laughs> And after a while, he uh, he bowed and said, "Do it, and made me the second happiest man in the world." <laughs> in 1962, I took a test for a showdown. Uh, Jimmy Takamori was the uh, administrator, and I passed the test, and I, I made uh, I made got promoted to showdown. And I didn't win a match for almost a year. I walked out on this weight class I've ever had was in Taipei. Uh, we had a three, two day tournament, individual competition one day, and then team competition the second day. And then we formed a 20 man team and we competed against the uh, Chinese uh, national team, which consisted of all their team members who went to the uh, Olympic Games in 1964. And we won a couple of matches, but they beat us. And on the third day, uh, they invited us to go down to the Taipei Police Academy. And there was only five of us in good enough shape to go, so we went. And they had 400 uh, uh, cadets. And they had been, been in the class for two years. And after they graduated in four years, they would make brown belt, but they were still white belt. So they bring five uh, white belts out, and we fight each one for five minutes. And because we were throwing the white belts all over the place until we got tired. <laughs> and then the white belts were throwing white belts all over the place. And they would throw us and help us up, and then throw us down again. And then Mr. Lee, the, uh, their coach, he stopped the uh, slaughter and saved us. I'm going to fast forward to uh, uh, 1971. Uh, I got transferred to Barstow from uh, Vietnam after my second tour. And I uh, formed a club in Barstow and I started training the uh, juniors for a junior national competition. Uh, during my years of training to this point, I had found that uh, judo practice made these kids a lot stronger, it made me stronger, and uh, competition helped you overcome stress and fear, and it helped me, so I figured it would help the kids. And then learning how to uh, get along with other people, uh, on and off the mat, that helped them more, than so that took care of those three things. So in 1971, I took my first three students to a, a junior national tournament in uh, Mesa, Arizona. One kid came in seventh place. In 1972, I took uh, six kids to uh, Rochester, New York, and one kid came in fourth place. And I'm thinking something is not right. Uh, these kids are fighting good. They're doing what I tell them, but then I win it. And so I uh, decided to incorporate some of my Marine Corps training into my judo training to maximize their uh, push-ups and sit-ups. I incorporated pull-ups, endurance running, and timed the wind sprints. And I kept a record on these kids' project progress, and it worked. In uh, uh, 1973, I took uh, 11 kids to uh, uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, and one kid won a gold medal, two kids won silver medals, and two kids won fourth place uh, certificates. I started uh, uh, refereeing in 1971 at the Junior National Tournament, and uh, I got certified in 1975, and I refereed uh, for 40 years before I went into emergency status. Uh, during uh, the years between uh, 1973 to the present, the Barstow Judo Club uh, students have won 
333 uh, national and international medals. And You know my my top students, uh, uh, Delos Brody, Belinda Binkley, and uh, Chuck Jefferson. They did, did better than uh, all my kids. Uh, Belinda was an alternate on the women's team in 1992 for the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. Chuck Jefferson was an alternate on the Olympic team in. Uh, 2008 to Beijing, China. Because they had left my club at this time. They were, I still call them my students. Uh, when we uh, first started uh, a judo, we, uh, we could uh, beat up everybody in our club. And we used to go to the same tournaments. We could referee in our judo gis and you could fight on one mat and run off to another mat and referee. We can't do that today. <laughs> and so our kids, our kids wanted to grow up and be like us. And now that we're old, we fall down, we can't get back up. <laughs> the kids don't want to be like us anymore. <laughs> and so in order to, to maintain you know, like we remember, we got to have continuity. Uh, we got to find a way to keep some of the uh, the kids who make it to the top level in the club, so the little kids will have somebody to look up to. I have uh, <clears throat> told you a little bit about my judo training and uh, a little bit of why I like judo and some of the things I think judo will, is good good for you and what it will do for you. And at this point, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, sit back and, and, and watch my kids fight uh, for the gold medals. And I want to thank you for listening. Our next speaker, we used to have cat fights. Uh, he's a great judoka. He's a fantastic judoka, actually. He does probably the best uh, Uchimata around, uh, next to Jimmy Brentman, of course. <laughs> but that's Toshino. Actually, he started out with a Hanegoshi technique that is hardly ever done uh, today, but he can still do it, and uh, he's a fantastic guy, so let's welcome Tosh Senghor. Uh, at Hollywood. He was supposed to be there, but I think by the time I started Judo at Hollywood, he was already gone and he was into wrestling, so I didn't get to know him that much, but uh, did I walk up with you at Hollywood? Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there was sure not go be there. I think you kicked the shit out of me. I think you kicked the shit out of me. <laughs> pictures of Tosh, and uh, I should have said that with Ernie as well, but every speaker that's up here, you get to see some of the pictures that they, uh, when they were young. Anyway, my name is Tosh Seno, 
Um, I was born in Hawthorne, California so many years ago. I forgot already how many years ago. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm a U.S. born sensei raised in Japan. I went to Japan in 1945, no, yeah, 1945 after the World War II. Uh, a family was put into the camp in Two Lake, if you know where Two Lake is. That's where most of us Japanese who lived in West Coast were incarcerated in 1941 when the war started. So we spent about four years in, in the camp and uh, my father was one of those nono boys, if you know what, what I mean. So he took us back to Japan and uh, I spent about 10 years from grade school to uh, high school. I graduated from high school in 1956 and uh, I came back to the United States. So when I came back, I went to Denver where my sponsor lived. I was still minor, you know, I was not 18 years old, so I was, I have to have a <coughs> sponsor to uh, uh, come to the United States and I had to go to Denver where my uh, sponsor was. And I had a cousin lived in uh, Denver at the time and he was uh, also a member of uh, Denver Dojo. And uh, he talked me into start judo in Denver where I started my judo. So that's where my judo career started. Uh, but I didn't like too much. I did, there was nothing much to do in Denver. So I decided to come to uh, LA after four months stay in Denver. And uh, when I came to uh, Los Angeles, I didn't have anywhere to go except that my uh, brother was working for this American family as a schoolboy. I don't know if you know what schoolboy is, but uh, I'll explain to you later. <coughs> and so I decided to live with this American family um, as a schoolboy and uh, to study uh, English. And this schoolboy is uh, you do housework for like uh, cleaning the house, cleaning the swimming pool, wash cars, and, and do dishes in the kitchens and stuff like that. Uh, those uh, American family era, uh, that time used to hire this uh, Japanese exchange students and uh, students like myself who was looking for a part-time job and uh, to uh, learn English. Uh, after staying in Japan for 10 years, I didn't speak much English, just few words. So that's what I was doing at, uh, in, when I came back, I mean, came to Los Angeles in 1956. Uh, <clears throat> By doing schoolboy, uh, they provided me with a room and board in the same house, and uh, they paid me about fifty dollars. Uh, that's a spending money. Can you imagine me living in on fifty dollars a month? Uh, you know, allowance. I don't know how much it, it was now. Maybe a couple hundred dollars. But anyway, the money that I made, I have to pay for my bus to go to school and uh, also buying clothing and also pay $10. I think it was about $10 to uh, uh, study judo at the Hollywood. How much? Uh, $10. It was $10. No. Uh, $8. For no. well, $8? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You okay. still own two. <laughs> anyway, so $8, okay. Uh, so I joined Hollywood Dojo in January 1957, where Mr. Kikuchi uh, was a head sensei, right? right. And uh, also Frank Watanuki was assisting him, and there were Emmy brothers, Frank and uh, Art Emmy. And uh, then there was uh, several young uh, upcoming uh, judokas about my age. I was uh, 18 at the time. So I started judo when I was 17 when I arrived at uh, Denver Dojo, so it's kind of late for getting into judo. But uh, uh, when I was in Japan, I was into swimming. 
so I didn't have time to uh, take up judo. But uh, I watched my high school class classmates uh, working out in the base gym and practicing judo, so I was kind of, you know, interested in doing it. And also, uh, when I was in the camp, I know my father was uh, into uh, amateur sumo wrestling, and uh, watching him doing sumo, uh, I thought maybe, oh, this is fun, you know. And uh, so my father kind of influenced me into uh, kind of getting into judo. Okay, at the Hollywood Dojo, um, we had, like, Jin LaBioyue, he was already uh, two-time uh, heavyweight and a grand champion. I think it was 1953 and 54. Four and five. Four and five. Okay, then we also had uh, Art Emi, who was a uh, 160-pound uh, champion, champion. Yeah, in 1955. And also Ben Takahashi, who was a uh, lightweight. He was a second-place winner in the 19... A lawyer. Yeah, lawyer, mm -hmm. became lawyer later on. Right. So he was uh, one of the you know top um, senseis and also a good uh, judo national, national champion. I think he came in second or something. <coughs> Maybe he took first. So uh, I had a good uh, judo class there uh, at the Hollywood Dojo. And uh, only thing is, uh, this uh, school where I was staying at first, it was um, kind of far away for me to uh, go to. I didn't have, I didn't own a car, so. Uh, but there was no uh, transportation to go to Hollywood Dojo, so I had to rely on my judo friends to pick me up to uh, Dojo. So a few months later, I decided to change my schoolboy job closer to where the dojo was. That was uh, near uh, City College, LA City College. So I changed my job to there, but then they paid me only $40, $10 less than the previous place I, you know, I worked. So that $10 you know, was kind of tough for me because, I, like I said, I had to pay for the bus and buy my clothing and stuff like that. So uh, I don't think I could pay that $10 uh, fee to Dojo. So Hollywood Dojo was nice to uh, waive that fee with a condition that I clean up the Dojo and close the Dojo to go home. So that worked out pretty good for me because I wanted to work out a little bit more longer. So uh, they gave me a key and uh, I stayed longer with about three or four other uh, exchange students who also wanted to stay longer to work out. So there's about four or five of us. We stay about an hour to and a half longer to work out. And uh, I used to take the last bus back to where I was living that was about 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. So <laughs> until then we were working out at the dojo. And uh, uh, beside judo, you know, I was still 18 years old, young. Uh, I did not have any other hobby or interest like going to a dance party, go see a movie, bowling, you know, things like that. Young people used to do and enjoy themselves, but uh, I didn't have any money and I didn't have uh, you know car to get around. But it worked out okay for me because I can concentrate myself on uh, judo. So that's what I did. Uh, so I was working at Hollywood Dojo, and one day uh, Mr. Shake. I think everybody will remember Mr. Shake Tajima. Yeah, he came to uh, visit the Hollywood Dojo and he saw me uh, working out and I was throwing people around with overs only because that's about the only technique I knew at the time. But he saw me uh, using overs to throw people and he pulled me to the side and he says, hey, say, oh, come on over, I want to show you something. So I said, oh, okay. Then he pulled me to the side and uh, I guess he thought I was uh, suited for Hanegoshi. Anyway, uh, I started practicing Hanegoshi, and uh, he was right. Uh, I was able to master Hanegoshi, and that became my uh, pet technique, favorite technique. So I thank uh, you know, uh, Tashima-sensei for teaching me his Hanegoshi, uh, which made me able to uh, win the uh, national championship in later.
which I didn't think I, I would like it. So uh, by having him, uh, you know, inviting me to join the uh, Air Force, and also he promised me that he would send me to Kodokan after basic training. So I said, oh, go to the Air Force, and after basic training, he's going to send me to Kodokan. The reason was, at the time, uh, Air Force had a, a special arrangement with Kodokan uh, to uh, raise, uh, train and raise uh, self-defense instructor. So uh, I said, oh, that sounds good. So I, I decided to enlist in the Air Force in 1959, October. And after uh, basic training, I was uh, uh, assigned to, uh, I was sent to Tucson, Arizona, uh, to Davis Mountain Air Force Base. Um, and then there, uh, after a few months later, I was sent to Kodokan. And uh, the Air Force sent me to Kodokan three different times. Uh, 1960, 61, and 63. So when we went to Kodokan with a, a special arrangement they have with the Kodokan, they taught us not only judo, but other martial arts like uh, karate, aikido, and taiho jutsu, not kendo, taiho jutsu. Taiho jutsu is uh, Japanese police uh, restraining technique. Uh, required by my job as a uh, self-defense instructor. So uh, they sent me to Japan three, three different times. And uh, at Tucson, Arizona, there was no judo on base. So I went out to, uh, to uh, I'm sorry, that was the Davis month and I first place. And I went out to Tucson uh, and found there was a judo dojo named Rendokan. And this Rendokan was run by Mr. Ken Carson and his wife. I think yes. some Chris of you guys Christine. remember Ken yeah. Carson. Uh, he passed away about three years ago. But, so I was able to uh, practice judo at uh, uh, Rendokan. And uh, well, during my uh, four years, and then I was uh, discharging uh, 1964 uh, June, but I spent about four years and nine months in the Air Force. And during that time, um, I was able to compete in all the national championship and was uh, sent to uh, compete in the uh, World Championship and the Pan American Game uh, during, that, uh, during that time. <coughs> and uh, uh, Hayward was uh, with us also uh, going to the Pan American Game and World Championship. And uh, <clears throat> I was uh, fortunate to have my base commander allow me to uh, compete in most all judo tournament with uh, TDY. And uh, well, coming back with a medal, championship medal kind of help. And uh, so I was discharged in 1964 uh, after four years in the uh, most of my <coughs> judo highlights were accomplished between 1960 to 1970. I won four national, AAU national titles in 70 kilograms in 1960, 61, 63, 65. Participated in Pan American Game in 1963, 1967, winning gold and silver, and World Championship in 63 and 70, uh, 67. Uh, I was placed fourth and fifth, and I went to the Olympic game in 1963 in Tokyo, and in early 64, uh, selected to uh, U uh, U.S. team to visit England, France, Netherlands for Goodwill tour. Uh, you were with us, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, and also, uh, Hayward and I grew up pretty much about the same time, and uh, Hayward was uh, also uh, competed in most all the tournaments I mentioned, and won his share of championship, and uh, we were on the U.S. team uh, several times. Okay, my time is coming up soon, so I'm gonna try to finish it up. 
Uh, oh, if there was one thing I most regretted, or I should say disappointed in my uh, judo career, comp uh, competition-wise, uh, one is uh, I did not make it to the Olympic uh, in 1964 because I lost to Paul Mariama two to one decision in the Olympic trials in 1964 in New York. And uh, the worst decision I lost happened in Pan American game at Winnipeg in 1967. You were there, right? You took gold medal. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm saying this is uh, I lost uh, in the final two to one to uh, this uh, Brazilian player in the final. Uh, I thought it was one-sided. I thought I won, but decision went to Brazilian player who took gold. I could not believe it. Then after the medal uh, presentation, this uh, Brazilian guy came to me and told me he felt bad because he knew he lost the match and I should have won the goal, but that was nice of him to uh, you know, uh, tell me that. So uh, the another thing was my 70 kilogram uh, Decision, uh, division was the last group to compete, and by then, U.S. team had won already. So my uh, division was the last one to compete, and uh, other countries were not happy about U.S. wiping out all the four, the four uh, divisions. Well, I don't know, that's a reason, <laughs> that was the reason why. But this, uh, when there was a decision, uh, Two referees gave one to me and one to Brazilian guy. And the main referee, he was a Canadian guy. He gave his uh, <coughs> uh, flag to a Brazilian guy. So that's how I lost my match. But I was so mad. So I was so pissed off. <laughs> I, I refused to accept that medal because I didn't think I lost. But I forgot the coach. Who was the coach then? Yeah, anyway, he told me, Tosh, you know, you didn't throw the guy. If you lost, go ahead and go get your silver medal. So I said, okay, so I, I got my silver medal, but um, still, I think, uh, you know, I never should have lost that match. Anyway, um, there's a few more things I wanted to say, but then later on, I think we have a question and answer uh, yeah. section, so uh, if you have any questions or... I have a question. Yes. <laughs> You got paid forty dollars to this to, uh, to clean the dojo and stuff like that. For what months? Yeah, I was the Mahaka jeans. I got nothing and I cleaned. Oh. <laughs> speakers that you're listening to, they're all my heroes. These are my heroes. Uh, these are the guys that I looked up to, and Tosha is one of the most fantastic guys to watch at every, at every tournament, and uh, he was the scariest guy to, to work out with, too, because he would, he would find the hardest parts of Hollywood Dojo's mats and try to throw you onto that hard spot. That's a lie. That's not a lie. That is not a lie, because I've landed on it a couple of times. Here's the thing about uh, all of these guys. They come from an era that is bygone now. Uh, from dojos that are not even there anymore. That are actually ghosts in our memories. The ones that were able to uh, experience that. You know, and you know what I'm talking about when you walked into places like Hollywood or places like Sainan, you just, uh, you went, oh my God, here I go. And then after you got beat up, after you experienced a mat that's all curvy and full of bumps and, and dips and everything else, then you went into the smelly back room 
and you found the showers, you tried to get to the showers, and you felt like you were in the haunted house at uh, one of the amusement parks because the, the floors were crooked. And then you, you took your shower, and it was on cement, but you were happy to do that in that cement with the water just dripping down on, on your face and you're going, oh, how lucky I am, you know, to even experience that. And these are, these are the ways that these guys worked out. Uh, you won't find that anymore. You go to Gokor's gym now, and he has a real shiny, nice shower, <laughs> nice room, <laughs> lockers, you know, we didn't have that. But anyway, I just wanted to mention some of that uh, to you. Anyway, our next speaker comes from an era even before that. And there's a uh, famous physicist, and I can't remember, remember his name. He was a Nobel laureate, and he said, um, they said, well, isn't it great to be a great physicist? And you won so much in, in, the, in the Nobel Prize. And he said, you know, the only way that I was able to win that prize uh, was because of others uh, on whose shoulders I stand and reach for the sky. And so that was pretty neat. I thought, uh, I think uh, I, I gained from these guys' experience and, and learn from them. And I hope that other people will learn from us speaking here. Uh, our next speaker uh, is one of my great heroes. Uh, Hal Sharp. He's produced a lot of videotapes, but you know what? In his own time, in his own right, he was a fierce competitor. And it was before the time when we had national championships and things like that. But I saw him compete. And I've never thrown this man. As with Gene, I've never thrown Gene. You know, I got close, kind of stumbled him, but neither one of them. I've never been...
I made uh, Showdown in seven months. That's monthly tournaments. It's all competition. But talking about competition, in those days, it was all eight point judo. If you got a wazadi, you didn't win. Eight point only. And, uh, and otherwise, anything other than that, both players sat down. So you fought until you either beat, you're either beaten or it was a draw. That was it. So in about four and a half years of fighting in Japan, I think I had almost 100 tournaments I was in. All of them were Ippon Judo. Only one of them was a decision where they had to have a champion. And I didn't even know I was in a championship. I thought I was supposed to go to a special judo event. The Prince of Japan, they had a martial arts day by the palace, and they had all the top martial artists demonstrating. And Mifune Sensei was God in Judo then, 10th degree. And he asked me to join a team of foreigners. He wanted to show off foreigners. And he told me, he just assured me it's just Rondori. I forget what injury I had, I always had an injury. Well, it turns out it was a championship, and I was so mad, I won. I beat everybody. And the only benefit of it, the only thing I ever won in judo, believe it or not, a few weeks later, I found out I, this silver sake cup with a gold chrysanthemum in the center. And I was told I was the 1954 Gaijin Judo Championship champion. I didn't even know I was a champion. I knew I won that match. You know? And um, so I just have to tell you that when I came back to the States and I met my this girl, we were working together for a CBA outfit, and anyways, uh, we were just buddies, and I took her to my house, and my wife had Parkinson's then, and she met her, and really fell in love with her, and she took me in the living room, grabbed me by the shirt, put a fist in front of my face, and said, you marry that girl. So I got married, and I didn't have money for a ring, so this is what I gave my bride to be. <laughs> I went back to her apartment. She was living with three other girls. I says, look, I'm engaged. <laughs> so that's the only thing I ever won in judo. And I, I finally got to use it. <laughs> so again, it was... Um, um, actually, I was... I don't want to say born into judo, but... Uh, ever since I've been a kid, I've been a fighter. I was raised in South Philly. And all I did was boxing and street fighting. And I never lost a fight. If someone picked their hands up in front of me like this in school or something, the left hand came out and flattened his nose. If they jumped me, I got them across the gut, doubled them up. And if it was really serious with a big gang, then the next thing was a weapon, and the weapons we used in those days were glass milk bottles. All the streets we had to roll out here. See the movie, uh, Rocky? Well, that's where I lived. The streets all rolled, and they had people put their milk bottles up. So if you got into a fight. Anyways, that was my background. The next thing I know, I'm in the infantry, taking training. And the last week of training, um, this was in World War II, um, I came in covered with mud from a patrol in the swamp, and we were told um, they dropped a bomb and got rid of a whole city. The next thing I know, two weeks later, the war was over. <coughs> so I ended up in the occupation of Japan, 1945 and 1946. But I just got exposed to Judo there. I still didn't know it until I came back as a civilian in 1950 when I graduated from college. And then I got, I got such a Judo bug, I had to train every single day. I wasn't necessarily, it was a Kodokan. It could have been a, a dojo I made at the base, Machi dojos, I trained at the police. But the thing that, that, that I really, was the thing for my success, I said in seven months I was a Shodan, most of my students became black belts in six months to a year. Um, one year later, I'm a Nidon. One year later, I'm a Sandan. And boy, fighting in Sandan is like fighting the college football team. I mean, these were tough guys. And it was Ippon Judo. So what you had to learn to do, it's just like fighting. You know, in fighting, you don't go up and punch a guy. You let him punch you, and you take him. Someone's attacking you, and this is what it is in judo. Everybody's out there to get their opponent. So I had to learn how to read a person real fast, and how to take advantage of whatever they did. 
So it was a different level of judo. And I'll just mention a few little things uh, along the way that helped me. Uh, there was an Englishman, he was about six foot something, he was very good at judo. And I was, a, I think, a white belt. And he came up to me and he says, Arnold, you know, we can't get under those squatty bodies. So do osotogari. It's like walking. And just and it's sweet. So I said, that's what I'm going to do. So I knocked myself out doing it. And like most of us, when we started osotogari, what did we do? We ended up, as we went in to step in, we pushed the person away, right? It didn't work. Then I was out in a little village one day, a little village called Inariyama Komen. And there was a, a dojo there, and the sensei was about this tall. And he came over to me, he saw me knocking myself out for Osoto. So he showed me a movement that stayed with me all the rest of my judo. Tsuri Komi, a circle like this, right side, left side. Once I started that, I creamed everybody. I used it for Haraigoshi, for everything. And then I learned, there were two throws used to catch me. Sioi Nage, those little guys would drop under me and I would look at them and as I looked at them, they might, I went over. <laughs> the other one was Maki Komi. They raised his hand in the air to come across and I'd look at the hand. And I'd... <laughs> so, then, so then I learned, if you just stand straight, normal, and just look right through them. If they're real short, just look over the top of their heads. If they're tall, just look through their body. And guess what? They couldn't throw me. So I became fairly good on not being thrown. Uh, anyways, um, I did a lot till Shodan. Then when I got into the Black Belt League, it was another ball game. And uh, again, this thing called uh, Shizentai, where you just you just cool it. You're just natural. Just have the the confidence that you're not going to get thrown. You can stop people. And then certain people had a big influence on me. And one, one of the, the last ones, and the, my whole career is just full of these little stories, but the last one was Ishikawa, two-time All Japan champion. And sort of what happened in, in my time, when I became Shodan, I wanted a book on judo. When I started judo in 1952 at the Kodokan, this was the only book, a little pamphlet. <laughs> That's the only thing that you can find on Judo. So I stopped by the Tuttle Publishing Company to buy a book, and he says, there aren't any. Well, I didn't see, they didn't have a bookstore. It wasn't like the Kodakon today where they have a bookstore and all sorts of books. There was nothing, no bookstore. He said, why don't you write a book? I thought, me, write a book? My two worst subjects were English and phys ed. So I, so I wrote a bestseller. That book sold over 150,000 copies, and it became a part of the Judo Champion. Uh, what, what happened after that? You know, if you know the Japanese, when they get a bug up their rear on something, you can't stop it. You got to beat them with a stick. Well, I had a reputation, Ichiban, a Judo home writer. I'm the best on Judo books. The only one I ever did. So everybody came to me to write their books. Even me funny, the canon of judo. And I had to turn that over to Charles Palmer. The book was a mess. The English was English. You know, English. You know, there's some broken English. When I was a GI, we used to say this. There's three things you got to watch out for when you go into Tokyo. It's pimps, prostitutes, and English students. <laughs> Any event, um, the one book I did get, really get involved in, when I started working with Ishikawa, and then I worked with uh, Takagaki. Now his book was written 30 years before in India. It was a marvelous book. I, it was hard to read the, the writing, it was all handwritten. He would tell you how you make the technique work when the opponent steps forward, if he reaches high, if he does this, he does that, and that's how to do the technique. He was talking about the application, how you get the stuff working. Then he said, now if somebody does that to you, they're strong this way, but they're weak that way. And he showed the opposite, how to do it. And he did this on mat work and that. Well, that changed my way of thinking as a person on a, on a mat. And then uh, uh, Ishikawa wanted me to do his book, and he told me his life story as a child, how he became a champion, and, how, and the mind was the big thing with him. And now, I needed that. I was a happy fighter. My senseis, when they see me out there, I, I used to grin when I fought. 
they say, Sheriff, son, please fight. You know, fight. Stop smiling, you know. But with Ishikawa, I had to get myself, excuse the expression, pissed off. I'm, I'm, I'd bow and say, I'll kill you, that's so okay. I had to get do something, get mad. And then I'd go out there, go ahead, get your grip, show me how you want to lose. As soon as the guy get a grip, I'd take him and throw him. You know, and that was the way my judo went up into the Sandan era. So I did, I lost very little, and, and I, won, I won a lot. But anyways, the thing that happened to me and a lot of other foreigners that went to Japan to train hard, we all became damaged goods. So when I came home, I had some real old injuries that never forgot about it. And I had to wrap it up as far as competition goes later on. Okay, let me just uh, close with a few little uh, humorous things, I think. Like I say, uh, it was equal judo except on certain championships. And then the Tokyo Championship, by the way, you know, my folks, there was a, a fighter. <coughs> All right, this, this was my book, The Techniques of Judo, which is no longer being published as of this year, and that was the sport of judo. But this fighter from the police, he was tough. Anyways, Two tournaments, you know, they have to have a decision. To two judges, referee, red and white flag. End job, extension. Two extensions, that's it. They did it again. So how did they make a the decision? They didn't have coins. Rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> John Kemp Paul. This guy wins two matches with John Kemp Paul. <laughs> so Saturday morning, and I, I, was, I was either stupid or fearless, I go to the case show at the big police academy where I train in the morning and I go up to him and I say, Sensei, I guess you must say we practice real hard. And then when we stopped, I said, Sensei, in Japanese, can I see your Tokui Waza? And my voice traveled, there are all Sandans out there. And everybody stopped. And he goes, Which one? Jung Kim Pa. And I started to run. And he started chasing me around the back. Everybody started laughing. And then he stopped and he said, Sharp's on, battle boy. Uh, another one was, I, I noticed a lot of people did Kiai. And some people didn't. The Takagaki Sensei had a great sense of humor. So one day I said to him, Sensei, can you talk to me about Kiai? He says, you see my wife, and she was a little short lady in a kimono with a cute little face. He said, near the end of the war, they wanted my wife and the other women to fight the Americans. So they took them to the soccer field and they gave all of them spears. So they, they tied up their kimonos, the sleeves and between the legs, and they had these spears. And at the end of the field were dummies, they're the Americans. And this, the sensei said, Kiai, and they all started, yeah, running down the field. They got halfway there and they collapsed. He says, that's what I think about Kiai, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Anyways, my time's up, but thank you very much. And uh, it isn't that. Okay, okay. Let me, let me tell you about a couple of really good uh, the judo, judo lessons I had. Uh, I had done a favor for the guys at the at the case show. I had an old Pontiac convertible, and I took them someplace. And we got back, and everybody was leaving the mat. And I heard him say, no, Sagoi went in, Sharp's I missed his practice. So there was a visiting sensei. I wish I knew his name. And they asked, they tell him, practice with Sharp. So there's no one on this huge mat, just him and this man. And this guy's throwing me at random with Ikwon Sioinagi. So I asked him to show it to me. And that lesson was so incredible. He showed me, he used Ikwon Sioinagi like a counter throw. What he's really saying, in effect, is, if a person moves any leg, he's a one-legged man. And at that point, you can pop him. You don't get, get a, a, a good grip, a pocket grip. So I showed him how to use it against Osotogari, against Tayotoshi. And then he said, if the guy gives you the bars, you come over one arm and through the other, lock both arms together, mm -hmm. drop under him and take him. <clears throat> well, I couldn't believe what I just saw. So I went to lunch. Four o'clock, I come to the Kodakon. They're just opening. There's no one there. Charles Palmer from England standing on the side. 
and here come three big Husky Japanese judo players. And the one in the middle is Kaminaga, who became a champion. And I practiced once with Kaminaga, and he really thrashed me with his Toyotoshi. I was always going stronger than him. Anyways, so I went up to him, Onigashimas. He looks at me, he remembers throwing me, takes his glasses off, grabs me, comes into me with his Toyotoshi as hard as he can. He's halfway through it, and I, I buried him. He went through the air, and it was a big boom. You know, the mat, when there's nobody standing on it, it's hollow, the Kota Kani. And it just sounded like a drum. And everybody stood back like this. And Kaminaga got up, and he was really pissed. He comes up to me, and he grabs me, and he locks me, pulls real hard. Lesson number two, over one arm through the other, I came under him, I smashed him a second time. He got up, he looks at me and goes, I said, thank you. <laughs> and Palmer comes up to me and says, how did you just smash Kaminaga twice? He says, I know Charlie, I'm getting dressed now and go home. <laughs> That's it. That really worked with me. I developed what I call the sucker move. It's, uh, I, I would, um, get my pocket grip, and then I'd open up on my right side to make the guy want to do Osoto. And just as his leg would come through, I'd pop him and hit him, and spin him through the air and take him straight over. It was a nice move. And uh, so I'll leave you with the judo lesson, okay? <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, as far as books go, I'll just mention that briefly. Um, my first book, The Sport of Judo, um, there was a sailor who used to come and help me. His name was Turney. And he and Kobayashi and myself, we went into his living room. And Kobayashi would go through the throws, Turney, and I'd write down the steps. Mind you, I hadn't taken one photo. And then I would have Turney get a hold of Sensei, do what I say. And if the words didn't work, we changed the words. So the words in my book, if you have a blind person, believe me, they can throw it with this book. After that, I photographed it. There was a problem with my photographs that no one's ever caught. All my throws start out right natural position, you know, typical. For his opponent in the, in the photographs, he had his nephew, who's a lefty. His opponent's always standing with his left foot forward. No one's ever caught that, <laughs> but it works anyways. And, and so um, that book got published, and that's where I got the reputation. And then Takagaki's book, this one here, like I say. Now, one thing I found in reading judo books, every judo book has something, even one thing, that's unique. <coughs> People that write judo books are really into it, and they have some skill that's special. Uh, Japan was the land of Tokui Waza. Most people were specialists. And this was their downfall, where I was involved in tournaments. Because you never fight people that have their favorite technique. They set themselves up, and then you can take them if you know how. We have to, you have to read them. You have to know where, where they're weak. So if somebody stands this way, that way, moves a foot one way or another, you can take them. But you've got to read the guy and go for him. But don't try to do your own thing. This is the thing I found is weak with most players. We get trained this way. We learn, take, and we go out to do our technique. And what we're doing is. We're saying in a way, I don't care what this guy's going to do. I'm just going to go do my thing. I'm going to reach high. I'm going to do this and that. And if you do that, you'll lose more than you'll win. It's, it's good. It works. Everything in judo works. Don't get me wrong. There isn't a thing I've seen that I could ever say is not good. So anyways, that was uh, skill levels I had there. Okay, thank you. It was quite an experience. I mean, I had a lot of air time. I couldn't get a pilot's license from being up in the air that long. But some of these guys are just incredible people to work with. And it's, it's hard to imagine what it's like that Hal is able to just throw Kaminaga even like, like he did. Because Kaminaga also was a very, very tough guy. He was all Japan champion. Uh, did a good job in the 64 Olympics, came in with a silver medal.
a lot of these guys are really, really tough guys. And it's hard to imagine what, what it's like. And maybe, uh, maybe at the end, Jim can uh, also talk about some of those guys that he's, he's worked with that are really tough guys. Anyway, um, we almost, hey, look at that, it looks professional. It takes a pro on the right side. It's a tall guy too. The introduction. I mean, he's every time you turn on the TV set, you go, hey, "That guy looks familiar," and then you go, "Oh no, that, that's Gene. That's Gene." And I've said that so many times on TV. Oh, it's kind of a thrill to see somebody that you know on TV like that. And. Uh, Gene has always been my hero, and yeah. I could tell you stories about this guy. He would he would get you on the mat and scissor your head, and then start doing this rolling fall like thing, and you would have to flip over, flip over, flip over, and I felt like I was a flat tire on a freeway. Pop, pop, pop. But Gene would do that to you, and then he would look at you and say. Who's the best looking guy in the dojo? <laughs> and you would yell, You are, Gene! You are! Anyway, my hero, Gene LaBelle. Well, I'll tell you something, I don't have to be nice to you anymore. <laughs> I've got a full stomach, and I can rat my all of you now. <laughs> Anyway, to get down to business, and I have no business with my <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen and kids of all ages. <laughs> Miss Yoka Hayward, this damn thing on. I have got nothing important anyway. Miss Yoka told my little adopted niece, her name's Rhonda, she says, uh, he's only got 20 minutes to talk, and you know, Jane, he's got diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> so she came up with this. It's a stopwatch, and I can only go 20 minutes. And her, my little niece, Rhonda, her mother, said, why did you give that to Uncle Jane? Anna Marie's her name. She does a little judo. <laughs> She says, Gene can't tell time. <laughs> well, we're going to start it off anyway. Um, um, ask who I train with. Uh, a lot of people that have dojos, they say, just come to our dojo. It's the best. Did I ever tell you I did kendo? <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. I went to Japan to the Kei Jo Taikan. Some little dwarf like this hit me one of those propping kendo sticks. Beat the sh out of me. And then I grabbed it. <laughs> Different story. <laughs> um, I uh, trained at uh, Hollywood Dojo with Sensei. Uh, there are a couple of national uh, champions there. Um, Sano and I mean, you talk about national champions. These guys are great. I mean, they're, you look up to them. That's why I got a bad neck. <laughs> uh, so many people, it, it, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. Uh, Tosh Sano, Art Emmy, his brother Frank, all, well, Sano, you're still alive. All my uh, 
guys I used to do judo with, uh, they all died of old age. So uh, when I get to heaven, maybe I can run Dory with them. <laughs> anyway, I've trained at different uh, facilities like Hollywood Dojo, Sartell a couple days a week, uh, Say Not with Kunyuki Sensei. Uh, he hated me. Mm -hmm. I loved him. Great judo man, incidentally. I went to Tenri because he had a great shower. <laughs> <laughs> All the trained at the LA Athletic Club. The LA Athletic Club had professional wrestlers, not clowns, but the real uh, deals. And they do arm locks, leg locks, Greco-Roman wrestling, which is from the waist up, uh, freestyle, which is the waist up, waist down. You can do singles and double. That's leg grabs, uh, something that uh, Gokar likes. And uh, I uh, worked out at Main Street Gym, learned how to box. I boxed with a guy named Sugar Ray Robinson, if you've ever heard of him. And one of my big thrills is when I started doing movie work, I got to hire him in a movie. Um, um, I, I fought him the first time I worked with him. Uh, in the first round, he hit me 300 times. <laughs> uh, but that was okay. Felt good when it stopped. Uh, I worked with Archie Moore, who was a light heavyweight champion. Every person you work with, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a learning process. A lot of the dojos wouldn't welcome me. After I turned pro, um, a couple people from Nanka said, oh, Bakatori uh, Hakati, don't let him work out here. Uh, they're right. But I went to uh, a place, Hal Sharp, and he said, hey, mi casa su casa. My home is your home. And I worked out with Hal, and you could look at Hal and listen to him. Great judo man, don't care if he's ugly, he's still a great <laughs> Now, uh, a guy like that is a true judo person. Uh, you know, they, somebody you, you respect from the heart. Um, some of these guys I went against in tournament when I was in a, on a movie in Dallas, Texas, I went into a guy's dojo, Vince Tamura. And uh, I think he was on one Olympic team. A pretty good judo man, right? Okay. Um, he said, uh, will you honor us by working out? He gave me a double weave gi. Now then I used single weave. Double weave was very expensive. He gave me the honor of teaching the class. So after it was over, it was all sweaty and everything, I want to give it back to him. He says, no, you can keep it. And I thought, gee, what a generous man. And then I thought, well, maybe it was so sweaty, he didn't want a dirty old key back. <laughs> anyway, when I went out to his car with him, he had on his license plate an eight Dan, eight Dan. And he since passed away, I guess he died at 10th. Anyway, great, uh, great, uh, great man. I went to Sun Valley Dojo, and I met a couple people here today from Sun Valley. Um, I went there, I always carried a gi in my car. Any time you're a true judo man, you carry a gi in your car. Uh, so I went there and I knew they wouldn't let me work out. And, uh, but I went there anyway and uh, I went to uh, the teacher there, a little guy that I met in Japan. He said uh, hello and everything like that. And I said, well, the, I got my gi in the car, but uh, Nanka doesn't want me to work out a lot of your schools. And he showed me a picture on the wall of Jigoro Kano. 1882, he kind of founded this judo bit. And uh, he said, of course he'd let me work out. Sun Valley Dojo, I started working out there. 
and believe me, it was a great JoJo, and uh, a few of the people came in from other dojos that I wasn't allowed to, they weren't allowed, I wasn't allowed to work out with. So I had fun working out with these guys. Yeah. It's tough living with yourself when you're a sadistic bastard. <laughs> um, <coughs> now, in my waiting years, I only work out at one dojo. Why? Uh, because this dojo, which is called Hayastan Armenia, uh, they do a little bit of everything. MMA, has anybody ever heard of MMA? No, no either have I. <laughs> um, I judge a few of those matches every once in a while. I'll do anything for money, I'm a prostitute. Uh, they do boxing, wrestling, judo, Gokar Trevichan, to me, is the best teacher I have ever seen. The guy's unbelievable. He's a god. You know why? Because he had the best teacher in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and with all kidding aside, in North Hollywood, uh, if you want to come and visit us at Hyasan, I'm there Monday nights. And you can see his beautiful wife, Noreen, whose birthday is the fifth. Happy birthday, Noreen. Yeah. Um, pick your school, visit all the schools, and, and learn from everything, everybody. Um, I, one thing I hate to do is wear a tie. I hate to wear a tie. Sometimes you have to. Uh, I did a little charity work with a, a young lady named Anna Marie. She had me wear a tie. I said, I'm not gonna wear a tie. She choked me, I wore a tie. <laughs> I said, how about Dennis the Minister, your husband? He don't wear a tie, and he don't go with me. So she made me wear a tie. I cried for a while, but then I got over it. <laughs> also, the, the second lady is my beautiful, <laughs> charming wife, Mitchell the me was a student of Hayward's. She preferred Hayward to me. Because <laughs> he was tougher, better coach, and he was nicer to me. But that was 45 years ago. Um, Anna Marie, you'll be talking to her, listening to her later. She's the uh, first woman from this country to win the worlds. Uh, she's my hero. And it's nice to be around people like that. She even comes to uh, our dojo and teaches once in a while. Not for the students, just to. She wants to kick me in the shit. I need better security. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, and this, on the serious note, traveling around the country and the world, I was back east working on a movie again. I went into a dojo. And I said, Go, Minasai Sensei, uh, excuse me. Can I work out uh, here? There was about six back belts on the mat. And uh, they said, no, you stand back and you learn. Um, so I watched them and they do Nagata Kata, Kimana Kata, Junaga Kata. I don't do Kata cheese, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> and um, I want to rock dory, rock dory. And um, anyway, I looked on the wall, and this sort of changed my life. There was a picture, and an article, and a bulletin saying, Shig Tajma had passed away. Shig Tajma was the president of Nanka Yudanshakai. That's the Southern California judo group. 
here. Very good. And it read that he was in Manzanar relocation camp during World War II. I never knew that. You know, we were family. You didn't hear this hey, uh, prejudice stuff. It, it, it was great. And when I saw his name there and that he passed away, and if it wasn't for Shig, I wouldn't have done as well as I did because he was not only a teacher for me, he was my number one sparring partner. And uh, it brought tears to my eyes. And no man ever dies. No man ever dies until he, he is forgotten. And I'll never forget Sheikh Tashma. Uh, and I thank uh, Hayward for bringing his attention to mentioning a lot of the old champions. When I was a professional wrestler along with uh, um, stunt work and I narrated done uh, uh, wrestling on a few programs, a young man uh, from Holland came here. He won a gold in the Olympics. Uh, now, his name was Wilhelm Ruska. Ever heard of him? Yeah, you have. You're as old as I am, for Christ's sake. <laughs> um, uh, he was sent to me by Carl Gotch. Uh, he, the guy wanted to learn leg locks, heel hooks, which they do in MMA. Hayward does them. Uh, Gokar invented them all. Um, <laughs> He wanted to learn leg locks because they're illegal in judo. What I say is learn the things that are illegal so you'll be able to pass them off to your students before you die. Because when a teacher dies, a library is burnt. Now, as far as promotions go, a lot of the promotions are mail order, a lot of the degrees don't mean anything. I, I got a degree uh, from Holland from a guy named John Blooming who saw Goka and I work out. And it wasn't mail order degrees. He gave me 10th, I think goka has got 9th. But it's respect. You know, they treated me real well at the Kodakon and I got difference in kids. I've never got a code of con certificate. So I'm a white belt. I think I'll go there and challenge somebody. <laughs> <laughs> they let me take my squirt gun. <laughs> and these uh, degrees, the degrees don't mean a hell of beans. It's how good you are and what you can pass on to your students. And one of my degrees, one of my favorites, is the 13th degree in crooked shillelagh. <laughs> Am I lying? I do club work, uh, taught the police for about 20 years, and I don't have any striking. It's all an extension to your arm, which is a part of judo. Uh, now to get to something that's kind of humorous, gets me sick, but um, I was in the, uh, waiting for the 1954 Nationals in Kizar Pavilion, San Francisco. And all they talked about was the great Johnny Osako. And he was better than great. But he's leaning against the wall in a suit and a tie and smoking a cigar. And he's good. I, I, I said to my uh, uh, teacher there, Larry Korn, I said, he's smoking a cigar. Uh, smoking's the sign of emotional immaturity. How good can he be? <laughs> and another guy came up and he said, don't worry about it. As long as Max is only five seconds, he, he doesn't get tired. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we segue into later in the day and we're all lined up and I, I want to see Johnny Osako. So he goes in the first match and they say, they bow. They bow, Hajime, they begin, and I look, I said, what was that? I didn't know if it was Uchumata, 
Saranagi Hanagoch, who was, I didn't know it was Sudo Gary. I didn't know if it was forward or back. It was the fastest thing I've ever seen in my life. I said, my God, he's not real. I wanted to touch him, but I know he wasn't real. <laughs> and then, later on in the day, they're going through the different matches, and they mention Johnny Osaka again. And I'm waiting, I want to see him. I want to see him. what technique, I'm going to steal it from him. Write a book like Hal Sharp did. <laughs> Sell it all over the world. <laughs> and they mentioned Johnny Osako, and you could hear, ooh. And then they read, and his opponent, Gene LaBelle. And I said, where the hell's that weasel? <laughs> I'm looking around, and the guy's touching me on the side. He said, you, you hear Gene LaBelle. There is not Gene LaBelle. I don't want to be Gene LaBelle. You kill me. He's like this. So a couple guys help me up. I go out. I go to bow. Luckily, I have class. I did not throw up. So for a few minutes, he threw me around like a rag doll. I guess he must have gotten tired from smoking. Fell down. I fell on top of him in a nose night Comey and held him for 30 seconds. And that was the biggest upset of the tournament. Uh, don't smoke for you kids. <laughs> um, another kid I went uh, with, I call him a kid because he, he was younger than me, uh, a great national champion, died a couple of years ago, 10th degree, uh, George Harris. He went to Japan with us, he did very well. Uh, you know, guys like that, you just don't forget, you just see them. And now in the Nationals, or the Olympics, sometimes you can have four or five matches to be the champion. In, in 1955, I had 18 matches. Uh, they had, that's the time when You'd win your championship, and then all the champions went together in a round robin. So I had 18 uh, matches. I, hell, I can't even count to 18 anymore. <laughs> um, now, here's some of the ways that judo has helped me in my life. Completely changed my life. Three minutes. Huh? I got, I got three minutes to go. Anyway, I'll what? make it <laughs> no, no, <laughs> one minute. Okay, I'll make it quick. Uh, I was in LA high school, and if you wore court rights in eleventh grade uh, pants, uh, they'd uh, the football team would take your pants off and hang it up the right. flagpole. Well, the, they came at me, the two twin. Uh, guys, I hit their heads together, they went down, I grabbed another guy, Maka called me on these two guys that were down, the fight was over, and in the newspaper, the Roman, which was the LA High newspaper, is Gene LaBelle, is the only one in the 11th grade that, where, that can wear uh, corduroy uh, pants. <laughs> <laughs> and that's from uh, uh, judo. Uh, uh, I, I did, uh, did get, uh, get to, because of judo, get to um, represent in the first MMA, mixed martial arts, televised event, a boxer against a martial artist. I was the martial artist. And uh, Milo Savage was the boxer. He was number five in the world. He got, uh, the judo guy knew chokes, the, fighter, my opponent, he didn't know how to counter him, and that was that. Uh, one uh, other thing that just choked me, uh, I'll tell you one more thing. <laughs> I was, uh, I got to, lucky enough to meet in show business, different movie stars. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, 
a fellow named Bob Hope. Yeah. Well, you an actor. He was a classic, you know. He comes back in Burbank. They named an airport after him, Bob Hope Airport, right? I came back. They didn't. They didn't name an airport after me. <laughs> <laughs> Gene, I gotta tell you, you know, uh, Milo Savage? He's talking to you. Yes, sir, I hear you. <laughs> you know what? I know. And, and I'll tell you something. Nancy here, my girlfriend, she's going like this. Why don't you say something? Why don't you say something? Why don't you get up there and tell him that he's overtime? I'm going, shh, no, shh, shh. <laughs> Am I going to say anything? No. They're all afraid of you, Gene. That's what they said. <laughs> I have too much respect for them. And I have too much respect for all of the other guys, too. They all went over time. <laughs> Except maybe Tosh. Tosh, uh, I thought he was, uh, his time had ended, and he went, oh, shh. And he was trying to get up. <laughs> Uh, here's the thing about Milo Savage. Uh, someone had met him at the bar, and I, I, I was talking with these guys, and they said, oh yeah, we met him. We met this boxer, and the minute that we said we were in judo, and he said, do you know this guy, Gene LaBelle? <laughs> he said, you know what? I thought that if I held my breath, that I could stop his choke. <laughs> I don't mean to take anything away from you, Gene. I think you <laughs> That's why he was out for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> oh. It's oh. still over here, Brad. <laughs>
waste of time. Um, I have a doctorate, I publish scientific articles, um, I founded companies, like I said, I have four kids, three husbands, we'll work with her. Um, but you might think that judo has been a distraction from some of those things, and for what ought to be bigger priorities. You know, I got my MBA at 21, and you would think that I would leap ahead in my career at General Dynamics, and I did, but not as fast as I would have if I hadn't been chasing medals and, you know, traveling all over Europe. Right now, when I'm in a like when I was speaking at the Wyoming Native American Education Summit, some club two hours away in Casper, Wyoming, said, "Hey, could you come teach a little judo for us?" As Keith Nakasani said, "Share with us what little judo you know." And I said, "Sure." And you know, some of my investors said, "Hey, didn't you have anything to do?" Like my husband's not here because we have an app coming out in the app store, and he's putting up in beta tonight. So, and also, you wouldn't wear a tie, so that's it. Um, you know, when I was in college, my professors asked me that. You. Shouldn't you be studying? In, you're at scholarship, you know. You can't afford this university. Shouldn't you be studying instead of a judo tournament every weekend? You know, I skipped classes to go to the national judo championships for, yeah, which I won. And they were like, so? So, you know, there's, I, I'm going to ignore Hayward's advice, which I always do, sorry, because um, he said pick one idea and, and stick with that, but I'm instead going to just ramble on the way I think best. And I do that for my podcast, I do that for my blogs, and thousands of people read those and listen to them, and I do it with my four kids who have no choice to listen to me because I'm the only mother they got. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was really thinking, what did I get out of a half a century in this sport? And unlike a lot of you guys, I started judo when nobody wanted me to. I was a short, fat little girl, and my brother's nickname for me was Stumpy, because I look like a tree stump, and brothers are evil. And my mom told me that I was going to join something. I was not going to spend my life sitting in my, my bedroom and reading books and eating. And I had really thick, those horn rimmed, really thick glasses, right? The cheapest ones you could get. So one year, somehow, by a miracle, my mom got up enough money to pay for a family Y membership. And she put me in the car, and she drove me to the Y, and she pushed me out, and she said, go join something. And then she drove away. My mother was the opposite of a helicopter parent. And for those of you who are young, or those of you who are male, maybe never thought about this, but that was before Title IX. So back then, they just said, you can't do this sport. They just told girls, you can't play basketball, you can't play this. There were three choices, because it was perfectly legal to say girls couldn't do a sport. I could run track, which if you're a short, fat little girl, it's not your first choice, right? Um, I could join the swim team, which first of all is expensive, and secondly, if you're a fat little girl, putting on your swimsuit, not your first choice. And I could do judo, which was free if you had a Y membership. And it was free because the judo instructor had a sister who had wanted to do judo. And so he allowed girls to do it, which is weird if you think about in this day and age, but to say, we're allowing girls to do this. But that's how it was. And by the time I came along, she was a black belt. She got married. Her husband was a black belt. And so I was probably one of the very few women of my age that grew up with a female black belt instructor. And that taught me the second and third most important things I ever learned from judo. Because when I was in judo, a lot of people did not want me to be there. And a lot of them tried to beat the crap out of me until I left. And I'm still here, suckers. Um, and I'm not leaving. But there were a lot of people that did not think a girl should be there. And this is one of the reasons I got good at arm bars, too. Because I would say to people flat out, because you know, my, my daughters say, you know, my mom's little, but so is anthrax, and they will both kill you. <laughs> and I would say, you may throw me 50 times, but the next time you try slamming me like that, think about the next time we do mat work. What's the odds I won't get your arm once? So uh, that gave people a little pause. Um, when I was, well, I will get to this with later, but yeah, it taught me two things. One is to be the only woman in the room. I later on went to work for General Dynamics. I was the second female engineer they ever hired. And I would have to sit in rooms when I was in my early 20s in front of you know, a bunch of people like vice presidents of the biggest company on earth. And I remember looking around, you know, I had to sell this new computer program that we had developed in-house and convince them to do it. And I, I looked around and I could beat up everybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, today, there aren't a whole lot of, you know, there weren't a lot of little Hispanic girls doing judo back in the day, and there aren't a lot of old Hispanic women rubbing tech startups now. You know, when I go to Silicon Valley, I stand out like pepper in the salt shaker, but I have done it my whole life. So that's one of the things I got from judo. You know, when I went to the All Women's Championships, I was doing the, put, putting together pools for the black belt women, and it was amazing how many I talked to were programmers or were heading up a construction crew. They were all these non-traditional careers because they had 
gotten used to being the old, only woman in the room. And they weren't about to back down. So that's one thing I got from judo. A second thing, and I was telling Kenji Osugi this, that I think I passed on to my lovely daughters, is not being afraid of anything. My little daughter um, started judo at Venice, and then she was at Sautel, my little Julia, who's now 18. And when she was 11, she decided to start soccer. And that year, she made the city all-star team, which is pretty unheard of, because a lot of kids that she beat out had been doing soccer, playing soccer five, six years. When she was 17, she tried out for a club team, which most of the kids playing club soccer have been playing since they were 10. And she got three college scholarship offers that year. And what all of her coaches said is that's crazy. You wouldn't think a kid would do that with so little experience playing soccer. And Julia said it best herself. She said, Mom, I know I don't have the ball handling skills these kids do, but I'm not afraid of anybody. And I think that's what she got from judo. You know, when you talk about being knocked down, literally, I've seen her playing on the field, and Julia has not grown. If you haven't seen her in a while, she's still five foot tall. And she's playing college ball. I've seen her running, and they will smack into each other. These two kids will go flying in the air, hit the ground, and Julia will bounce up like nothing ever happened. And that's one of the things I learned from judo, is not to be afraid of anything. Now, if I told you the name of my early instructors, none of you would know them. Like you mentioned, y'all you mentioned people like Mifune and Osawa and Ishikawa. I heard of all those people. But this is a pretty important point to me. My mother had very, very little extra money. I took judo for several months, not one month like it said there, but for several months before I got a judo uniform. Because three of us, me, my brother, and my sister, started at the same time. And she said, you need to stick with it for at least six months before I buy a uniform, because it was $12. And 36 bucks for three kids, that was a lot of money to her. So we did stick with it, or I did anyway, and I got my first uniform shortly before my first tournament. And I walked there, and I fought, and I won, and I walked home. Because my mom had little kids at home, and she had to be there with them, and my dad was God knows where. And I was 12. And here is how I got the money to go to judo competitions. And I hope you think about this, because I think a lot of people don't. My mom had 50 cents a day for lunch, because she worked back when very few moms did. And judo tournaments were $2 or $2.50 entry fee. And my mom got my entry fee by going without eating lunch for the week. And that's how I got to pay for judo. So after I'd been in judo for a year, we couldn't afford another wine membership. And that's when my instructor stepped in. And he said the YMCA would offer me a membership if I would work as an assistant instructor then I could earn my Y membership. And he knew those were two magic words to my mom, work and earn, because there was no way on earth she would take charity. <laughs> so I was 13, and I started as an assistant instructor, and for the next several years, I took judo lessons at the Y. And I absolutely loved judo from the very beginning. And here's one of the things where I often think that the advantages in life you have are the disadvantages. You know, my brother really liked judo too. We both got to be brown belts and then he discovered girls and thought they were a lot more interesting than judo and that was it for him. But until then, we had a, a garage in our driveway, but it was all broken down so you could really park a car in it and there were boards falling down in it. But there was a bunch of junk thrown in there, like, you know, old crummy property house. And one of the things was a mattress. And my brother and I spent, I don't know how much time, throwing each other on that mattress. Because we had nothing else to do, right? We had no money. <laughs> We just go out there and all summer long and after school throw each other on the mattress. That was the most fun thing ever. You might think I would have better throws after that. Um, but what happened was I, I blew out my knee when I was 17. I just trashed it. I tore my ACL. I mean, I, it got stuck in the mats. And to this day, one of the things I do with my kids is I make sure the mats are, are proper. But I could step between the mats and got thrown from the knee up, from the knee down, stayed in place. And you would think at that point I would have quit judo. And instead, I decided to get really good at math, develops the best things. Now, people always laugh when I say that if it wasn't for judo, I would be a Chino women's prison right now, but it is the God's truth. You know, so many of my friends ended up shot or knocking over liquor stores and in prison or with four kids from three guys, and I was not a better person than them. I was just in the right place at the right time. So because of judo, I met people like my first instructor. I bet none of you recognize his name. His name was Bill Shelton. 
And in case you're wondering, he was a guy who had gone to the gone into the Air Force, spent three years in Japan, got a shodan, came home to a little town, and taught judo. And I know at least two other judo clubs in this country. Um, Tim Schultz, if any of you know him, Randy Rhodes out of Missouri, both of them came from his club. At least three of the people from his club, me, Tim Schultz, and um, Lee Nam out of Oklahoma, had kids who were national ranked players from his club. Somebody that never won anything, no, none of you guys know his name, it was just he thought it was worth spending the time on us. Because of judo, I met people like Bruce Toops, who not only funded a lot of my trips when I was young, because I couldn't have gone to Europe anymore and I could have flown to the moon, but he was also a really important mentor to me in business after I quit competing. I met people like Frank Fullerton, who has always stood out in my mind as the model of integrity I would like to be. And one of the proudest moments of my life was not winning anything. I was coming back from Athens, Ron had been the Olympics, Frank Fullerton and I happened to be on the same plane together, and he looks over at me and he said, I'm glad to see that you turned out to be worth all the trouble. And that meant more to me than any medal because Frank and Bruce, they didn't know me, they didn't owe me, I wasn't the same ethnic group as them, I wasn't related to them, I wasn't anything. They just wanted the U.S. to win gold medals and they thought I could do it. And so they helped me. And when I think back on it, it was worth it. Not for the reasons you might think, although I certainly, don't get me wrong, what is awesome and I certainly recommend it. But when I add it all up, what I gained from judo was from the good people that I met. Um, and one example, and you should ask your dad about this, Frankie, is I was down in Florida once, and Frank Sanchez Sr. was there. And somebody who had been an Olympic medalist was standing there. He said, Frank, why do you bring all these kids here? You know, that kid out there, some kid just got thrown for money. He goes, that kid out there is nothing. You know, except for one or two of them, they're going to grow up to be nothing. And Frank looked at him, and he said, first of all, that kid's having a great time. Secondly, that kid's parents worked just as hard to raise the money and bring these kids here as anybody else. And he said, third of all, none of my kids are ever nothing and you're an asshole. <laughs> yes, that's what I want to be like. So my point is that what I gained from judo was from the good people that I met. And not all of them were good. Some of them were pretty damn awful. You know who you are. <laughs> but the good ones made up for them. And most of all, I appreciate the good ones who were around when I was young and helpless and needed them. You know, now I've been somewhat successful. My lovely daughter, Ron, has been somewhat successful as well. Um, mark my words, someday, Ron will be known as Julia DeMar's big sister. Um, but there are a lot of people who would be my new best friend now. But the people I will never, ever forget are the people who was there when I was 13 or 14 years old and I had nothing. I was not a promising kid, believe you me. I was not a pleasant kid. Um, but nonetheless, they provided me with instruction and guidance and discipline and role models and sometimes money, in the case of Bruce and Frank, thank you. Um, and they changed the trajectory of my entire life. And I will never forget them. You know, just in case you wonder what I was doing at a Kata camp this summer, because anybody heard about that, I was like, what? Um, Ako Shepard was one of those people. She was an amazing judo player when I was 13 and 14 years old and living in Southern Illinois. She went out of her way to help me and teach me judo. And she said, I thought all I did was beat you up. But I said, well, you taught me a lot. And you spent your time with me. And so that's the reason that I focus the limited time I have for judo, working with young people in South Los Angeles. I was very proud to realize that the club of kids that I work with now, the feeder high, the high school they feed into has a 40% graduation rate. 60% of the kids drop out of high school in that neighborhood. Of the kids in our judo program, it's zero percent. And so that's what I know. It's great to win a world championships, but it's even greater to change somebody's life. That's all I know about judo, Harry. Advantage uh, comes advantage. It's a great one. I'll have to remember that. One. Amazing. And I think the story that she relates to you, all of you that are senseis, uh, you have you have kids in your dojo. Some of them are promising. Some of them are not. 
but some of them need help. And we all do that. We all help our kids. And Anne-Marie, you guys don't know this. I was talking to Steve Sank. Steve said, that's the woman that I admire the most, he said, of her. He said to me, do you know that she took eight, eight kids and took them on a field trip to learn about their country to Washington, D.C.? That's amazing. She just got sponsors and did that. And Marie, fantastic. We have some amazing guys here, and we all give of ourselves. The one thing that you have a limited amount of time on this planet, that's the one thing that you own. The only thing that you own, really, is time. And Well, I've got some good news. I don't have a prepared speech. Uh, I came here simply to thank my friends for the many years that they have spent paying it forward. One of the things that I admire about great judo players and dancers, I call them dancers, people that know the sport, they all play, pay it forward. Every child in your dojo, every person who walks through the door is valuable. And we impart the knowledge that we've gained from senseis in our past who have paid it forward to us. So I'm here to thank all of these legends for the thousands of collective hours they have put in paying it forward to all of the students. And over time, I'm sure that all of them have had students come back to them that didn't win medals. They didn't win world or Olympic medals. But Juno imparts to humanity a courage to stand up and do the right thing and to take care of one another as human beings. Now, one of the things that really confused me about judo was why on earth it's translated as the gentle game or the gentle way. That part of judo I really don't understand. Uh, 56 years ago, I landed in Tokyo, Japan, Haneda Airport. I trained for four years. Hayward and I were Kenshusei students. It wasn't a gentle way. <laughs> but having gone through that, and having learned from senpais and senseis who took the time to spend with young men and young women, that was the important thing. One of the amazing things about American Judo that has happened, Emory is an example of that. We just had a young lady, Kayla Harrison, win two consecutive gold medals in two Olympics. In 1950s, women were constrained to be in the back of the dojo <laughs> and wear white belts, a white stripe, in whatever belt they had. Now most modern judoka would never remember that, wouldn't know that. But all they could do, officially, was kata. Now that form of discrimination is unspeakable today. But that's the way it was. But the women in those days had the courage to stay after class and work out with the men and learn Rondori and did a good job. In 1974-75, there was a thing called the British Open Championships and women from the United States won gold and silver medals 
at that tournament and the rise of women in judo to become equitable partners in paying all of this forward is one of the unsung stories of our judo community. It's rather amazing, actually. But when you see a kid who comes onto the mat, timid, frightened, perhaps uh, was bullied as a child, like I was, and the teachers spend time with him, the self-confidence grows, and ultimately, as Anne Maria said, and many of the others, you're not afraid to lose. There is no fear. And when there's no fear, everything is possible. Because if you get thrown 7,000 times, you'll get up one more time than you've been thrown. So I would like to, again, thank these remarkable legends for the stories they've conveyed. Thank Mr. Inishioka for the work he's done over many, many years. And thank Jerry, he Jerry Hayes for retaining the knowledge, the historical records of what's happened since judo came to the United States. Wow. Thank you all very much.